to everybody joining this webinar. I'm delighted to be working here with the SBRC, where I'm a board member, to chair this event and to welcome old friends and new. As a scene setter, fakes and counterfeits are on the rise absolutely everywhere. Once the domain of luxury goods, every product you could ever imagine, and many you wouldn't, are faked. Indeed, Europol reported last week a 400% increase in fake goods relating to fighting COVID-19. That's pretty scary. Sadly, I know all about fakes and fighting them from my own experience, and this is what led me to Snapdragon, but less of me. Today, we have a fabulous range of speakers to provide guidance for consumers and for businesses to ensure we can shop safely and keep business revenues and reputations intact. So let me introduce the speakers and then I will pass over to them in turn. Firstly, we have Phil Lewis, whom I've known for a long time. He's the Anti-Counterfeit Group's Director General. He's the UK Government Senior Policy Advisor on IP Crime and has written many IP crime enforcement strategies, as well as establishing the enforcement and intelligence teams at the UK Intellectual Property Office, known to most of us as the IPO. He's, the, he's seconded to the EU as the national ex, senior national expert, and he also created the European Union's Observatory on Counterfeiting and Piracy. He's a former chair of the UN ECE on Intellectual Property, a member of the Organised Crime Task Force, and was awarded the Global Individual Award for Anti-Counterfeiting in 2014. Welcome, Phil. We then have Andrew Masterton, who's the Detective Sergeant at PIPCU, Disruptions and Engagement. He is responsible for engaging with stakeholders and brands to build a more effective response to IP crime and better develop working practice to target and disrupt criminal activity in the UK. He also manages proactive operations into suspending .uk websites, online piracy of creative material through an infringing web list, website list, and all the education work, including cease and desist notifications to infringing sellers of physical goods. Jane Donaldson is the inspector of Div Divert and Deter Safer Communities. Since 2018, she has been the Police Scotland lead for the Divert strand of Scotland's serious and organised crime strategy, known as the SOC. The overall aim of this prevented focus aspect of strategy is to, to divert people from becoming involved in serious organised crime. A key theme of the strategy is to protect individuals, businesses and communities from the effects of illicit trade. Vicky Brock is the CEO of Vistalworks. She's a serial entrepreneur who has recently co-founded her fifth technology company, the consumer protection software startup Vistalworks. She's developed data technology that helps consumers stay safe from the risk of dangerous, fake and illegal products when they shop online. Vicky was named Inspiring Woman of the Year at the 2019 Scotland Women Tech Awards, Most Inspiring Business Person at the 2017 Entrepreneurial Scotland Awards and won Innovator of the Year at the 2014 FDM Every Woman in Technology Awards. John McKenzie, who is a partner at Shepherd and Wedderburn and Head of Commercial and International Disputes, an experienced Lister advocate, John deals with a range of commercial litigation and has particular expertise in intellectual property and IT manners. matters. John advises on IP infringement issues and particular online brand protection for clients in a variety of sectors UK-wide, including energy and utilities, banking, IT and manufacturing. He is a former chair of the ADR Committee of the International Trademark Association. A very, very warm welcome to you all. Thank you very much for participating in this. And without further ado, I shall pass you over to Phil, but I shall stop sharing my screen first. So I shall do that and then over to you, Phil. Thank you very much. Phil, I can't hear you, I'm afraid. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can now. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, I, I seem to... <laughs> the first thing that's gone wrong, uh, I seem to have lost the um, uh, my presentation for a moment. I'm terribly sorry. 
technology and me. Um, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, it seems to have disappeared. So uh, I'm going to try. Tell you what, Phil, why don't we um, pop on to Andrew instead and while well, you find it and then we can come yeah, back I'm to you. I'm so sorry. Would that I'm so work? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's all it right. was there a moment ago. Thank you I'm very much. Fully, these things happen to me all the time. Don't worry about it at all. Andrew, would you be happy to pop in just now? Changing yeah, the order slightly. Does that work? Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Andrew. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. I think we're still seeing Phil's screen. Okay, um, I'm sorry. There we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so, my name's Andrew Marston. I work for Pipku. Uh, we're based in the City of London, part of the Economic Crime Directorate. We have two main responsibilities. Uh, they are trademark infringement and copyright. And we deal with those in three different ways. Uh, first of all, is disruption. And then we look at enforcement and finally education. Uh, it gives a bit of an overview of the work we do, um, looking at hard goods as well as copyright creative material. Uh, since the pandemic, we've shifted our business as usual, as a lot of you have into working remotely and more online. And we've also taken on a role uh, more dedicated towards COVID products, which I'm gonna talk a few cases through each other. And then slight advice on when buying products uh, and how to kind of recognize those items that aren't necessarily as, as uh, genuine as you first believe. Uh, first of all, we can talk about a case relating to uh, face masks, where a number of items were purchased uh, upon delivery, uh, these items would believed to be uh, not the standard required and such they were reported to the local trading standards. Uh, some of us have talked by ourselves and through joint working uh, identified the seller through a platform on eBay uh, and again through themselves put the disruption on this occasion uh, where we stopped the eBay seller. The items were returned and as such there was no health risk passed on to the, the purchasers. Just on that, I'd obviously recommend if you're looking at purchasing items such as face masks or other PPE equipment, I appreciate there is a shortage, um, but looking at sellers such as eBay, a bit more research into the individuals and where you're getting it from. The next case that we dealt with recently was someone selling uh, NHS branded products, so lanyards, identity cards, etc. cetera. Um, initially, we suspected this was being used for fraudulent uh, obtaining through benefits. So as most of you might be aware, NHS staff have extra um, chances to go into shops early. Um, there's certain companies offering discounts and we initially suspected these items being purchased to allow these discounts to be obtained fraudulently. We engaged with the seller, uh, attended the location and as such we could confirm this wasn't the case. Uh, they were in attempt to sell them for what they intended to be honest measures. And uh, through a cease and desist, which is a, a non-criminal uh, action through ourselves, we can seize them and the owner disclaim them. Uh, our largest case of note is in relation to fake treatment. This was a report initially from the US where they sent a number of testing kits uh, and what they came to be treatment centers over there. We identified the location of the seller, uh, attended where they're being sold from, uh, and as such, the suspect was arrested. Uh, and over a thousand of these treatment kits were seized uh, and identified to have harmful chemicals in. Um, confirmed with Public Health England, there are no current treatments for COVID-19 and as such, the advice is if anything is advertised as a treatment, this is not the case. This person is currently on remand, uh, waiting a full trial in August. So that's just a bit of an overview of the work we've done. Um, and I, I'd like to follow on with any kind of educational piece in relation to purchasing of PPE and testing equipment. There are a number of testing options available um, through private sales, uh, but most of them through advice of the MHRA is any testing kit or PPE. If you go to their website, you can check against the codes that they provide and as such confirm if the items you're buying are genuine uh, and complete products. Um, we also work closely with the NCA with any international and national referrals. So if there's any items that are coming in to the country, the NCA uh, basically holds any reports through their net, which is the National Economic Crime, 
centre, it just reduces the deconfliction of any reports. What I pass on to yourselves as individual businesses is if you're buying any products, whether it be PPE or protection from the staff, is to make sure that the sellers are genuine. Check out other resources to confirm that the items are genuine. And if you're not sure, either don't purchase or report to your local police. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was, fast, that was absolutely fascinating. Phil, would you be ready to follow on now? Well, I certainly hope so. I think. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Um, so, uh, apologies to everyone who's watching, um, um, and welcome to Wales. And I hope everyone's safe and sound. Um, um, as Rachel said, my name is Phil Lewis. I'm the director general of the Anti Counterfeiting Group, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the whole counterfeiting scene and what uh, ACG and partners are doing about it. So without further ado, um, we represent about 3,000 brands in 130 countries around the world as some of the most prestigious brands in the world. Um, and we work on the ground providing active intelligence to government agencies to facilitate operations. And we also are the center of, a of an international network that provides advice on all aspects of uh, product counterfeiting. And generally we're, we're working to try and change the public perception about counterfeiting as well. Um, so what's this about? Well, the growing danger of intellectual property crime um, is one of the key things that I'm gonna talk about. But I'm also gonna mention uh, the value of IP in society and what we're trying to do about IP crime. Um, Let's just go back to how big this problem is. The trade in fake goods represents about 3% of world trade. And someone told me once that that's equivalent to world tourism. Um, the global value is about 509 billion US dollars. And 7% of all fakes coming into Europe, of all uh, goods coming into Europe now are fake. And just to give you a, a little bit of a picture, the size of this problem um, in terms of um, revenue and money is equivalent to the GDPs um, of Austria and Ireland and the Czech Republic. So this is a massive, massive problem. Um, the OECD and the European Intellectual Property Office have produced some fascinating reports uh, about the counterfeiting. And I have to say that traditionally, um, the high-end consumer fakes are still available. But what's happened recently is that counterfeiters have begun to move into more dangerous areas, such as machine parts, automotive parts, toys, pharmaceuticals, of course, cosmetics, alcohol, and even food. Um, so the range of fake products is continually expanding. And you can see how nimble the uh, criminals are uh, just in this time where we've been subject to this COVID-19 um, threat, um, where they have moved into goods such as clothing, uh, protective clothing, sanitizers, testing kits, um, and even sports equipment as people seek to keep themselves fit, of course but also um, even cardiovascular equipment. Um, so the last one, of course, is the remedies and treatments, which unfortunately some people have been subject to. The latest EU customs report uh, confirms that 37% um, of all goods, uh, fake goods coming into the EU now are dangerous to the health and safety of consumers. So you can imagine how, how, how dangerous this is. I, and the question is, if you knew that an aeroplane had a 37% chance of falling out of the sky, would you buy the ticket? Well, um, unfortunately, people are still buying counterfeit uh, goods, which can damage the health and safety of their families. 83% of all counterfeits now come from China and Hong Kong, but there's a growing range of countries that are actually uh, becoming involved in this. They are vulnerable to the criminality. And in many countries, uh, these economies can't match the illicit trade in the size of profits. Um, so the traffic has become the nation's big business. Um, wh why IP crime then? Well, IP crime generates about 28% of jobs in the EU, about 60 million. Actually, if you, if you take into account companies that rely on 
uh, intellectual property. That's up near uh, 80 million. And it also contributes 42% of the total GDP in the EU. So um, the thing is that criminals always follow the money and they recognize where high profits are, but they also recognize high opportunity and low risk. And I'm afraid that's where product counterfeit in has traditionally fallen. Um, it feeds other forms of criminality. Andrew just spoke about the dangers that we're seeing most recently, but PIPCO, um, the Police Intellectual Property Crime Unit where Andrew works, Europol, Interpol, um, the United Nations Interregional Crime Office, and the World Customs Organization have all given clear evidence and reports on the links with organized crime. Massive profits from fake products have been channeled into, into drugs and human beings and even weapons. Um, and of course, there are related financial crimes as well, such as money laundering and corruption. The biggest losers, well, you can see that we're on the list, but also, you'd, as you'd expect, USA, France, Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Japan, and Spain. Um, so what's the ACG doing? Well, we play a major role in trying to advise policymakers on plans and strategies and even regulations to improve protection. Um, we work with government to identify challenges and opportunities. Most recently, we've been working with them on the impact of Brexit and how could, we can ensure cooperation um, and intelligence exchanges. Um, on the ground, we have our own intelligence coordinator who is a central point of contact for business and enforcement. And he helps to package intelligence from our members, which can help to facilitate operations on the ground within the EU, um, UK. In the past year, the ACG has helped to contribute to numerous operations across the UK and also uh, wider in Europe. And we've netted goods with, uh, with a street value of, of around 20 million. And that was just in the last 12 months. Um, we're also active in trying to train uh, business brand protection managers, uh, help enforcers to understand the wider issues. We hold roadshows and seminars, and we are regular contributors to magazines, art um, and the press, and even television media uh, on the dangers that, can, uh, that people are facing because of um, intellectual property crime. Um, the bottom line is we don't think any single body or country can crack this on its own. Um, organized crime is, is deeply involved now and it's very, very widely uh, organized across the world. You wouldn't be able to move the, the volume of counterfeits across the world unless there was organ organized crime involved. Um, how do we crack it? Well, we're part of an international uh, relationship. Um, not just in, in the UK, of course, but, uh, but in the EU. Uh, and we work together very closely with enforcement and also with business right across the globe. And we believe that sustainable results rely more on cooperation than actual legislation. A lot of people call out for uh, stronger legislation, but in fact, if you haven't got enforcement, it's pretty useless. So um, our business is about helping enforcement and then helping government to, to be more effective on the ground. And again, we work very closely with, with Andrew's team. Um, so um, the price is getting higher, as I've said. There's a global and borderless problem now um, since, um, since globalization has grown. Um, the UN Convention Against Organized Crime is probably way out of date. Uh, and as a result, supply chain security lags behind. Um, there is a need for more effective partnerships directed by government, but I think we need the complete involvement of business because these are the people who actually know the business. They understand the products and they understand the weaknesses in the supply chains. So um, to do that, we need end-to-end -end strategies and common priorities. Uh, planning and strategies are really important, but if we've all got different priorities and different uh, strategies, then we're not going to get very far. Um, all of this is going to be time consuming and it's going to be expensive, but as I've said, it can't be left. Um, somebody once told me that this is the most effective form of globalization they've ever known. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, and it's being driven by organized criminality, which is infecting 
um, other countries that are more vulnerable than the UK. But of course, it's taking away revenue and business and, um, and threatening our consumers. And this revenue could be used for vital public services. Um, so you can see the damage that this stuff can do. Um, so on that, I'll end. Uh, happy to answer questions. And um, that's just my email address and you're welcome to contact me at any time. Thank you very much. That's great, Phil. Totally fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. So moving from Wales back up north again, Jane, may I introduce you? Jane Donaldson, Inspector of Divert and Deter Safer Communities. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Rachel. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And thanks to Phil and Andrew for giving us that overview of the international and the UK perspective. I want to give you an idea this afternoon of how illicit trade and structure works and is dealt with within Scotland, and in particular, what we've been faced with since the start of the coronavirus outbreak, and in particular, the government lockdown um, procedures and our focus on prevention. Out with the current situation that we're all dealing with, Scotland already works together to tackle illicit trade through our Scottish Anti-Illicit Trade Group. This brings together law enforcement, so Police Scotland, Trading Standards, HMRC, I think we've mentioned the IPO already, uh, together with businesses such as Rachel Snapdragon, SBRC, Film Industry, Broadcasters, etc. We already meet regularly and we work together to share information and pool our resources uh, to prevent illicit trade online and target offenders, sorry. Scotland, as already mentioned, Scotland does with other countries has a problem with widespread sale of illicit goods. This includes unregulated, counterfeit and substandard products. Notwithstanding the current challenges, most illicit goods that we, we see now are sold online through selling sites, social media or direct from websites. And I think it's probably has been alluded to already as well, this causes numerous problems. We as consumers, we're all consumers, we're often aware that the goods are fake. The products are often substandard and will pose a risk to you as the user. Um, legitimate businesses suffer and um, given the competition and the undercutting, but also from a UK perspective, the tax revenue will be lost. And like um, both Andrew and Phil have mentioned, this is by any definition, serious and organized crime. So this is the underlying environment um, that we're dealing with day to day anyway. So what's happened in the last few weeks? Quite a lot, I think you'll all, you all admit. So what have we been seeing? We're collating the data daily now. And we get reports from Police Scotland uh, from our Scottish partners as well as the UK and international partner, partners and we're also um, looking at press reports. As the Scottish communities start to deal with the uncertainty and the isolation, there is a rapidly increasing variety of scams relating to coronavirus outbreak and the subsequent changes of how we're all living our lives um, and how we're having to work. So it's too early to say, so whether there's either just a re there's an increase in crime or whether uh, people who are involved in this kind of criminality are refocusing onto COVID related scams and using this as a hook for what is their normal criminality. It really is too early to tell. What we know so far, and it really is very early doors as far as crime profiling is concerned, is that the COVID fraud related illicit trade um, threat is broadly manifesting itself in three ways. First is those who are un that is undermining the health outcomes. I think it's already been mentioned that's PPE, cures, tests, hand sanitizers, fraud against the government's um, support measures. So as uh, Rishi Sunak stands up there at five o'clock and says business grants, rebates, um, then the fraudsters turn to that. And again, more broadly, fraud against the person. So again, looking at will that be charitable donations um, or looking at what's the new one for the police just now is the, the, the fines that's associated with it against fraudulent um, attempts to try and get money out of people that way. So what this has tended to then react to what is current, as these things are spoken about, as it gets government attention, as new um, things come on to try and support people, genuinely support people through this time, then those who are involved in this type of criminality will respond to that with unseen quickness, to be honest. Um, and again, I think, probably adding to what Andy had said earlier, fake good wise, hand sanitized PPE testing kits. Um, and just to show you more generally, what else we've seen is HMRC rebates, government grants, um, and online shopping continues to be a risk as for many of us, that is the only way to get some goods, uh, more so now than, than 
prior to the lockdown. What we're seeing is the way that these things are being done are no different than before the restrictions. Most uh, fraud and illicit trade is cyber enabled. So we're seeing emails, which we refer to as phishing and smishing, which is text messages. And most of these are pushing the recipient to click on an attachment. So either to elicit money from you there and then, or to harvest your personal details to use or to sell at a later date. Examples in Scotland, there are quite honestly very little has been reported to police, training standards and advice direct Scotland. We do assess though that there is a level of under-reporting, there always is with this type of crime. Um, and perhaps also, like perhaps the, our NHS colleagues are seeing, people don't want to bother agencies at this time. Um, what we've seen uh, examples in Scotland in the last couple of weeks, um, an individual ordering significant amount of face masks for sale in the UK, um, reports of a shop selling test kits. Um, there has still been some doorstep crime, um, this new coronavirus disinfectant, if only that was on sale, um, has been sold door to door. So again, people turning their hand um, and trying to make um, good from other people's um, disadvantages at this time. Who do we think are affected? This really is an assessment from previous experience because as I said the limited crime profiling that we have to date. As all elderly, those over 70, those who are shielded or otherwise vulnerable, perhaps having to access more services or different services, not having access to the usual um, community or family uh, links. Those whose incomes have been reduced due to not being able to work. Those of us who are home working, home schooling, and obviously the businesses that are affected by government shutdowns and having to buy um, PPE or IT or various to kind of support your businesses in this new way and not necessarily not, not just a new way but an overnight new way of working. So what are we doing for COVID related incidents? Pretty much what um, Andrew, Andrew mentioned from PIPPU but we are focusing primarily on fraud and scam prevention. As I say we refresh our information daily we're sharing information within Scotland and the UK fraud response is coordinated through the National Economic Crime Centre. We also had our Shut Out Scammers campaign, which was our annual national doorstep crime campaign, which this year coincided with the first week of the lockdown on 23rd of March. So we quickly rebranded um, our campaign. And if this works for me, let me see if this will work for me. We, go. Um, we quickly rebranded what it was we had to do um, and for the first two weeks of the campaign um, we sought to uh, put out some information about cyber security and online shopping as I say the, the focus very much is on prevention so just a couple of takeaways before I finish today I would say is be scam aware be cautious um, being a police officer, that comes kind of hardwired into you, but I appreciate it. it's not the same for everyone. If you are buying from any online seller, um, please um, look for reputable online vendors. If you are buying online, um, credit cards are a good way if you have additional consumer protection. Don't share your bank details. Um, be skeptical if you receive anything by email that refers to coronavirus. If it is something that you're interested in and there is attachment, don't click on it. Go to the, the source website and get the details from there. If you are working from home, another part of the cybersecurity advice is, is try to use a reputable VPN, a virtual private network, and that would make your, um, your online activities more secure. What we are seeing also is if you are a victim of a crime or you think you've been a victim of a crime or attempted crime, we are open. We are, are welcome you to call 101 or uh, unlikely to be an emergency, but if it is Treble 9, please do um, report it to us. We are, as I say, we're collating it on a daily basis. For further advice, I would point you towards our um, Scottish Government's consumer protection line. Um, for cyber crime advice, the National Cyber Security Centre has some excellent resources. Likewise, Stop Fraud for the Fraud. Uh, Vicky will talk about Vistal Works. Um, in a second. 
and also trading, our colleagues at Trading Standards Scotland are doing a, a sterling job in collating the scams that we're aware of and producing um, a, weekly, a weekly bulletin. So that's me. Thank you very much, Jane. That was fascinating and great to hear how it's all kind of coming together from a national in Scotland and also UK basis. I think, I think it's really important that people understand that we are all trying to do this together, which is fantastic. That leads us very nicely into what Vicky's going to talk about. So Vicky from Vistal Works, may I introduce you now, please? Thank you. Thanks, Rachel, and also Jane. Um, I just have a quick go at sharing my screen for uh, a couple of um, slides. Is that working? You seeing that? Not yet, no. Okay, let's try this. How's that? Can you join with that, yeah, Rachel? Yeah, yeah, we've got that. Thank you. You can see that. Nice. Please, thanks. Excellent. Um, so we're a tech startup. We, our role is very much uh, protecting citizens, communities and economies from illicit trade online. This was a $2.2 trillion problem a year before this coronavirus related explosion. But I'll just kind of build on what Drain was talking about. And, and give you a little bit more of a sense of what illicit trade is, because it's more than just counterfeiting. Counterfeiting is a huge part of illicit trade, but that's IP related crime. It's where there's an existing trademark or intellectual property owned by you as a business. But there's an awful lot of other kind of illicit trade and we're seeing it all explode right now. For example, anything that's unlicensed, untested. Now, the very first thing we saw in this coronavirus context was an explosion of homemade anythings, homemade sanitizer, anything that was in short supply. There was some creative person selling a homemade, unbranded version of it that doesn't meet any kind of health standards. It hasn't been approved by any regulatory agency out there. And the thing is, this stuff is dangerous. It could be made with anything. Um, also under the illicit trade category is things that have been withdrawn. So prior to, um, prior to, to COVID-19, we were looking at things like babies' car seats, children's car seats that were still on sale on eBay and Amazon, despite the fact that they'd been associated with children's death and withdrawn years before. And also under the ba banner of illicit trade is things that are repurposed, that are simply not legal to be on sale to the market that they're being targeted at. And some of the scariest things within that are things like medicines, health products, chemicals, alcohols, and foods, all of which ironically have exploded in the last month or so online um, as, um, as consumers have really been in a very difficult position. And what, what, what's causing it? Um, three things that any one of these three characteristics causes a uplift in illicit trade. What we're seeing is all three of them together. So we're seeing scarcity, we're seeing urgency, we're seeing unfamiliarity, um, and a huge fear of missing out, which for us as consumers, as shoppers, as businesses, is a really legitimate fear. Um, unfortunately, it's a really easy fear to exploit. Um, but as consumers and as business buyers, we do not make good decisions when we are under the pressure of urgency, scarcity and unfamiliarity, especially good purchasing decisions. And the illicit traders out there are exploiting that thoroughly. Some of it is opportunistic, you know, your person trying to make a quick buck at the first drop of a hat. But most of this, most illicit trade connects back to organized crime. You know, this is not a victimless crime. This is not harmless. This is not kind of um, something that you're getting one over on the system or the man by buying from this. You're putting your health, your business, your family 
at risk. Um, so I'll just share a few of the things that we've picked up. We've basically built um, technology to help detect, protect and enforce regulation and laws around illicit trade. And I'll show you some stuff from the protect at the moment. This is our consumer facing tools. Uh, they're free for consumers to use, but they're also used by the agencies like Trading Standards Scotland, Police Scotland, um, to help and advise Direct Scotland as part of their public health and consumer protection messaging. Straight away, instantly, um, I mean, I'm, pr I'm proud to say in a way, like four or five days before eBay started looking at this stuff, our checker tools were starting to pick up fake corona testing kits, yours for £400 from a farm in Cumbria. Um, but, you know, th there was instant fear. There was fear that, that, that by consumers, by health agencies, th that they wouldn't be able to get their hands on this stuff. Um, so, you know, you can see why people do buy. Um, but, but these popped up instantly. As Andrew has said, uh, as Jane has said, there are no safe, licensed, effective cures, testing kits, anything for coronavirus. So if you're seeing this stuff available, you can absolutely be certain this is illicit. Um, it may not be counterfeit because it may not be breaking somebody's existing trademark or patent, but it certainly isn't legal to be selling. And you can almost certainly guarantee that it isn't fake and effective either. Also under the banner of illicit trade is medicines that are being sold for purposes that they were not intended. So malaria pills. Malaria pills are not a licensed treatment for COVID-19. They may be being sold illicitly as such, um, but actually, if you're taking them, there are health risks, really serious health risks associated with that. And again, that is illicit trading. We're seeing all of these. But what we're also seeing in the top left here is a classic. You see this on Instagram. You see it on Facebook. This one's popped up on eBay. You're seeing essentially drug dealers, um, certainly fake medicine dealers using eBay, using Instagram to post a listing that's then sending you off site somewhere else to their extraordinarily dodgy site where you can buy your drugs and dangerous medicines. Please do not do that. Um, the risk is not that you will lose your medicine, your, your money, the risk is that you will die. Um, and I kid not, people do. Diet pills, all sorts of, you know, go work, watch some Europol videos, it will scare the hell out of you. Um, it, it's actually really disturbing. Um, so we've made these browser plugins that work on eBay, about to be launched on um, Amazon as well, that protect consumers as they, sh as they shop. We've also made this technique this technology available to people like Trading Standards Scotland. So you can put a listing in and check before you buy. We rushed this out um, very, very quickly and we continue to update it on, on a daily basis. Basically, Jane, HMRC, Trading Standards are contacting us daily going, we're seeing that yesterday it was thermometers. So yesterday it was like, we're seeing dodgy thermometers or we're seeing um, testing kits or we're seeing sanitizer. We're seeing disinfectant because disinfectant was getting blocked by the EU chemical regulations, which have now been opened up. But as soon as there was scarcity, other things were popping up. Um, if you are in um, a consumer protection role and you're from a legitimate organization, do let me know because we can make these tools very easily, near instantly available to you. Um, so, yes, I would say if there was just uh, one thing, one thing that you can do to protect yourself as you look at any kinds of online listing is ask yourself this question. How could this supplier possibly have legitimate stock now at this price? You know, if, if Tesco's haven't got it, if Boots haven't got it, if the NHS haven't got it, how come this person on a farm in Cumbria does have it? 
And, and if you just stop long enough to ask yourself that, you will avoid most of the scams. There are much more sophisticated, you know, multi-stage scams with genuine companies being faked. They are the minority. You will avoid most of this risk if you ask that question. I mean, we've built very sophisticated technology, but what our sophisticated technology is fundamentally doing is asking that question. You know, what's the probability of this seller offering this thing in a legitimate context? So good luck with your shopping. <laughs> Thank you, Vicky. Some very sound advice for all of us. That was extremely useful. Thank you. So taking the illicit sellers and hopefully doing some things uh, about them in terms of um, prosecution, we now turn to John McKenzie, who's our partner at Shepherd and Wedburn, who will be able to tell us that actually the law is alive and well in terms of taking action against counterfeiters, much to my delight. John. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, after hearing the uh, speakers um, this morning, you would think that uh, we are seeing only the, the worst of people, but uh, have a look at the news and you, you'll see that there's some, um, for example, on Twitter this morning, O'Ken is uh, trending with uh, uh, an example of the kindest gestures that uh, individuals can um, uh, give to others. But uh, what I'm going to talk about in, in the next uh, few minutes is the civil side of things. Um, there are a whole range of remedies um, uh, on, and techniques uh, on the regulatory and criminal side of things, and these have been uh, well covered already. I'm also not going to cover uh, things like eBay takedown uh, steps uh, and the uh, how to address individual uh, platforms because uh, others on the panel are better qualified than I am, looking at Rachel in particular, um, uh, and Andrew has also covered uh, that in his uh, session. Uh, and Vicky's covered some practical steps that can be taken at the first interface uh, with the consumer. But the civil courts still have a role to play here because the criminal authorities simply don't have the resources to deal with everything. Um, there's so much going on and brand owners uh, need to take action uh, themselves. Equally, not everything is criminal. Uh, and sometimes if you want some uh, compensation or uh, to be made good, you do need to go to the, uh, the civil courts. But what's interesting is that in these times of crisis, uh, people are desperate for uh, leadership. And information and trust is how I would put it. Uh, I'm not going to comment on political uh, leadership because that may open up a whole can of worms, um, but brands have an opportunity to uh, 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 show a way forward here. Uh, and, and that is part of the process of protecting their brands is to do the right thing. Um, uh, on information, uh, we have heard a lot about fakes and scams, but no wonder people are confused. Um, this morning, the BBC ran a, a news headline that said, uh, Kim Jong-un illness rumours denied amidst intense speculation. So there you have a leading brand uh, under the headline of a news story talking about rumour and speculation, which simply gives a context for any kind of nonsense coming through uh, can be mistaken for, for a reality. <clears throat> Uh, and from my perspective, trademarks are an important part of trust. Uh, they're a badge of origin. Uh, they guarantee to the consumer or the end user that the product or service is from a trusted source. Uh, and there are already examples out there of people taking advantage of this uh, fact, and it's not just counterfeits. Um, so uh, I saw a report of um, uh, one in the United States involving 3M, the multinational conglomerate, uh, who make face masks. And they raised court proceedings in the States against infringers who were trying to sell face masks to public authorities as part of a tender process. And what they'd done is used, used the 3M brand in their submissions to try and persuade the public authorities uh, that uh, they were, in fact, 3M face masks that were on, their, on the way. Uh, 
And there was also an allegation of price, price gouging, uh, which is where the price for the masks were 500% higher than they would otherwise be. Um, so trademark infringement covers a whole swathe of uh, different uh, uh, issues and can be complex. Um, but with counterfeiting, it can be more of a practical challenge on challenging, uh, tracking down not just the uh, uh, sellers themselves, but the sources of the product. Uh, and that can involve a bit of digging. Um, and what I thought I would do is just mention a couple of court orders that can help if you don't have the full powers of the, the uh, criminal authorities. Uh, the principal one in Scotland is the IP enforcement regulations. And what Regulation 4 allows you to do is to uh, seek an order uh, from the courts for the disclosure of information regarding the origin of goods and distribution networks. Uh, and so it's not just the source, uh, it's any person uh, having the goods or using the services can be asked for that information. Uh, and that can be a powerful tool to lever out information uh, from those who are selling the goods. Um, it's, uh, there are not many reported cases on the use of the power, uh, but uh, in uh, Scotland there's one involving, believe it or not, classical music from a few years ago. The, there isn't an equivalent in England because that power was already uh, available. Uh, and if you're familiar with English procedure, you'll recognise the Norwich Pharmacal Order. Uh, but that's effectively the same, which is where you uh, seek information uh, about what has happened to your, um, uh, to your product. Um, so in Scotland, it's an order under uh, the IP Enforcement Directive. In England, it's a Norwich Pharmacal Order. The other thing you can do in, uh, in Scotland is what the English call search and seize orders. And in Scotland, we call uh, orders under section one of the Administration of Justice Act. And what these do is allow you to seize evidence of infringement without notice. Uh, it used to be called a, a dawn raid until the rules were changed and you weren't allowed to raid at dawn. Uh, so uh, the issue with section one orders is that you need to be bringing a, a, a claim and what you're saying to the court is you're looking for evidence to support that claim. That tends to be expensive, uh, the Section 1 orders, because uh, you're uh, instituting a search team, uh, usually led by an independent QC. Uh, and if you've got a, a big network of uh, uh, possible infringement you're trying to track down, uh, that can quickly rack up costs. Uh, so if you're on the hunt for information or intelligence, then the courts uh, can assist. I thought we'd also just take a couple of minutes to um, mentioned what the courts are actually doing at the moment. And it's fair to say that the English courts are a fair bit ahead of where we are in Scotland at the moment. Uh, the judges uh, in England are taking a, a business as usual approach. Uh, and the default position there is that hearings are taking place, including trials with witnesses and cross-examination and experts and all the rest of it, unless there is a very good reason for them to be adjourned. The default there seems to be it's left to the parties to sort out the technicalities. So the English courts have adopted this platform, Zoom um, and Skype uh, or Teams. Um, and there's a lot of guidance out there about how these uh, hearings should be uh, conducted. On a slightly lighter uh, note, lawyers and barristers are quickly learning a whole new skill set. Uh, so backgrounds, for example, um, one comment was that the quality of the video was so good that uh, everyone could see the bottle of gin and the cricket bat in the uh, uh, cricket, uh, in the barrister's study. Um, the other one is dress code. What do you wear for this kind of presentation if you're a barrister? Um, uh, I don't think uh, the wig and gown is going to last uh, too much longer. Um, in Scotland, um, when the lockdown hit, uh, the courts would still deal with urgent business, but the message was very much um, it has to be very urgent uh, and it was child protection orders in particular that were uh, being prioritised. Um, in the last few days, the Scottish courts have announced that um, procedural hearings will be dealt with by telephone uh, applications for interim orders, which you would uh, typically seek in intellectual property cases 
will be dealt with uh, and by uh, telephone. I suspect we're a little bit off full trials with witnesses being heard uh, uh, just yet, but the, the uh, appeal court is sitting. So the Kezia Dugdale defamation case will be heard by uh, video conference over the next few days. And that uh, structure is being rolled out across the courts um, uh, as, we, <clears throat> uh, as we speak. So the Scottish courts are still open for business, um, uh, still able to help, and hopefully that's just uh, taken a few minutes to um, uh, give you an overview on what, um, uh, what can be done. If I may just take one more minute, um, I was just going to mention regulatory compliance. Um, uh, we, we've heard about um, some of the issues that are, are going on, particular attacks, cyber attacks and that kind of thing. Uh, just be wary about the um, statements of um, uh, uh, the loosening of requirements, particularly from the ICO. Uh, you'll need to tie any issue uh, that you might have in relation to data breach uh, to uh, the, the crisis. You'll not get away with um, a bad system um, being a justification for a breach. Uh, so just be wary of um, uh, taking your eye off the compliance ball uh, when, uh, uh, when working from home and adapting your business to this new, uh, new environment. On that note, I'll stop and um, uh, I think back to you, Rachel. Thank you very much. Fascinating to hear and uh, pleased to hear that perhaps wigs of, and the formal formalities of courtrooms may, may not be with us for that much longer. I'm sure that'd be much more comfortable for everybody. Well, I'm really thankful to all of you for um, excellent contributions. I mean, I think what we've heard from Vicky, from Jane and from Andrew is advice for the consumer, how to be sensible, think before you click, um, just do think very carefully about what you're buying. Could it be real? Could it be genuine? And then we've heard from Phil, um, and from John about what we can do with uh, as businesses. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of slides um, quickly if I manage to do this. I think often it's difficult for everybody to understand how easy it is for counterfeits to get to us and I hope this is legible but this is just an illustration of how counterfeits and fakes are produced in parallel with other products and how they get into the supply chain and even into things that we are all too familiar with such as warehouses of e-marketplaces that we may think we love. If you go around a large marketplace such as the one which isn't that far from here you will see that it is relatively easy for the wrong kind of product to be to get through the system and that's why you might actually receive it it's not actually anybody's fault, apart from the fact that the person who actually sold it to Amazon or used, oh, mentioned the wrong marketplace, to um, actually distribute it. So it's, in, it's, it's important that people understand that sometimes these things are, well, they're absolutely always about illicit trade, but the fact the person that parceled it up didn't necessarily know that the product was fake, which is always a problem. And this is a real example of how easy it is to be faked online. This is the product that I invented many moons ago. The one on the left is genuine and the one on the right is a counterfeit. So it's very, very easy to be duped online, um, no matter who you are, if the wrong kind of images are being used. Picking up on John's point about trademarks, if you are a business and you're selling product online, I absolutely believe that trademarks are the most valuable part of intellectual property that you can have. They're not particularly expensive to register and they will really, really defend you online if somebody is counterfeiting your product. I mean, it, it won't help as, as Vicky was talking about earlier on about products which are not counterfeits, where people are um, ripping you off as your idea, but not actually using your trademark. But if somebody is misusing your trademark, registered, tra registered trademarks are incredibly valuable, incredibly cheap and worth their weight in gold. So I am like Mrs. Trademark when it comes to um, trying to encourage people to register their IP. I know it's a bit of a kind of random. So uh, we've got some excellent questions which I would just like to share with the panel. Um, we have um, the first question. Now we'd like to go back and find it. Oh, sorry. So this one for Phil, please. How do we change the public perception in relation to the damage that IP crime makes? Phil, would you like to answer that? You can read it in the Q&As if you want to see it in front of you. 
That's okay. I, I, it's, um, it, it is incredibly difficult. I've been in this now for over 20 years and, um, and the, one of the biggest problems we face actually is consumer demand. Um, everybody in the UK and it seemingly all over the world has a bargain and a head and we're always looking for cheaper prices. Um, the problem with uh, compiling a strategy to, uh, to convince consumers not to buy is that there are so many different consumer segments. Um, I was once told, for instance, that if you don't get um, a child between the age of 10 and 14, understanding that um, illegally downloading um, film, music, software, whatever it might be, uh, if you don't get to them by the time they're 14, then you've lost them. Um, but of course, there are so many other different population segments as well. Um, there are people with money, people without money, and there are different drivers. What we're trying to do now is to understand the drivers a little bit more within each um, sector of the populace so that we understand why people buy them. And once you understand why people buy them, then you can have some sort of uh, safety net in messaging. Uh, in the past, I think that we've tended to use one message to try and catch everyone and it hasn't worked. So now there's a lot more research going on, going on to understand why people buy. Uh, and I'm happy to say that I'm involved with the Intellectual Property Office in developing this work uh, at the moment. There has been good work going on across the globe, but it needs to be more refined. We understand that. Um, and particularly now, uh, we need to be able to have a message, um, a consistent message across government, uh, government enforcement and business um, to warn consumers about the dangers they're they, they may be up against. Um, so it's, it's clearly having a better understanding of the communities and of the different sectors within them and then the drivers. Thank you, Phil. Vicky, I know you wanted to add something. Yeah, one of the things that came out when we were first building this technology with a lot of focus groups with consumers and consistently we heard the same question, where's the harm in a bargain? And what we've tried to map the warning messages to is exactly that. This is the harm in this bargain. Phil's absolutely right. There is a great swathe of consumers who do not care and are not prepared to change their behavior, but there is a group who really, really would not deliberately purchase something harmful to their family if they were aware of the risk. And so one of the things that we found most effective in trying to influence consumer demand, because that's really where we specialize, is in mapping that to the harm. This is the harm in this particular bargain. And obviously there are different segments. We have about eight large personas and segments that we work with and the harm is tied to the product itself but that for us is the key thing to convey in all the messages that we send out. I couldn't agree with you more and actually from the point of view of somebody who has had a baby product counterfeited the reason that I bothered to actually try and take the fakes offline was that if somebody put if the if the fake product was rubbish and somebody's baby was hurt then how ghastly would that have been? And actually, I was absolutely driven as a neurotic parent to get the fakes offline so that nobody else's child was hurt. And all of the products in the main that we work with at Snapdragon are driven by a need that people do not buy fake products, as you were talking about earlier on about fake parts of airplanes and all the rest of it. Fake bike parts, motorcycle parts, all this kind of thing. They are so dangerous. And I think the other issue is that brands often aren't that keen on telling people that they're being counterfeited or faked. And actually, there, there's absolutely no shame in that at all. You need to tell your trusted, trusted chain of supply and distribution that you've got a problem. And the more people are aware, the more they will work with you to make sure that you're not, you're not out there. When I was part of a presentation yesterday where somebody else on it proudly told me they had some fake Lego. I have to say, my face really fell. It was a dreadful thing to say when I was on the presentation. But you know, we need to really watch these things. Things like fake toys are often poisonous. They've got the wrong kind of plastics. They don't um, adhere to even just general product safety regulations. So these things are absolutely crucial. Would anybody else like to add to that comment? We've got one other question, but it seems to be about trading standards. So I don't know whether that's one for you, Jane, or um, possibly Andrew. 
I would like to say uh, just one thing, um, Rachel, please. Um, just about the way that brands um, have different strategies to uh, try and convince consumers or not to buy. Um, we've come a long way. Uh, when I first came into this, the pharmaceutical companies were very, very nervous about telling people um, that they had a problem with counterfeits. And the reason being was that they felt that if they told them they would have uh, they had counterfeits in the market, then people would lose uh, trust in the brand completely. And so um, pharmaceuticals that could be very, very helpful were not would not be bought because of that um, because of that loss of trust. So th th it's a very complex uh, landscape, really, and um, and sometimes it's, it, it can be very frustrating trying to explain to companies why they should come clean. But then when they come up with some of these answers about you know losing brand reputation and trust in something that uh, in a whole wholesale way. Um, you begin to understand how difficult these messages need to be uh, refined um, to, to try and convince consumers either one way or the other. So it, it's a difficult, very difficult landscape trying to, trying to um, navigate. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this work with the Intellectual Property Office and come up with a, a wider spectrum of messages that will work. Thank you, and very true. So just very quickly before we finish, um, we've been asked about um, how do businesses or trading standards demonstrate to the courts more effectively reports that the damage IP crime has done, so it's better reflected in the sentencing. John, would you like to pick up on that, or Jane, or Andrew? And to wave at me as to who would like to answer. I could definitely... Sorry, I was going to say very briefly, obviously we have to work within the legislation. Um, making the, I'm sure your reports are um, as good as they can be. Obviously, you, you also have recourse to proceeds of crime um, legislation too. Um, but I do appreciate the, sometimes the, the, the penalties don't look um, like the, the fitting of the crime. What I would say then there is that for me, given the, the stuff that Vicky um, and Phil has mentioned about the messaging is that prevention really, I think, is the, is, is the, the crux to this. There's always going to be um, a, a place for enforcement, but for the, for the public and for businesses to understand what the impact, uh, impact of that is so that it, we're not just arresting our way out of this problem. But um, I, I would, rather than giving you some advice on how to, to, to fill out your, your prosecution reports, um, but I do appreciate that it, it can seem sometimes quite, quite lenient. Um, but obviously there's recourse to the work that John does as well. Thank you, Jane. Does anybody quickly want to add that? Otherwise, I'll just wrap up and let everybody carry on with their shopping online. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, add in a few minutes if, uh, if I can. Is that working? Um, yeah, we, we've, we've suffered similar sort of um, instances in the, in the question. What we found is, as has been mentioned, the disruption and engagement side, in particular from me, the education piece um, to the courts. Um, so we started taking victim impact statements from any trademark holders or copyright holders. We've also gone to cost analysis on the impact to demonstrate, um, for instance, uh, film piracy. It's not just the loss of the, the revenue from the cinema, it's a knock on effect to the people who work behind the scenes and kind of educating the courts when they're making that decision. It isn't just someone selling a DVD or selling a fake pair of trainers, for example, for a relatively low price. It's a wider impact the brand recognition, the trust in the public in that brand, and then the knock-on effect to that business. Uh, and it has gone some way in the majority of cases to um, not necessarily increase the, the fines or the sentencing, but at least give an understanding to the court and their options to then develop that choice. Uh, and as other people have echoed as well, it isn't just the enforcement side, it is that wider engagement with the public to say how dangerous products can be, not just a bargain um, for a reduced pair of trainers, again, as an example, that they haven't got the, the necessary safety qualities that a genuine pair would have. And we found that that, that dual purpose has worked quite well for our patients. Thank you very much. Well, on that fitting note, it's all about safety. May I thank you all very much again for participating and wish everybody a safe period ahead of them um, and particularly safe shopping. 
Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.